Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to those who are um, in another time zone and joining us today. Um, this is the uh, Native Education and Native Languages panel um, for our first Biden-Harris Tribal Nations Summit. My name is Anne-Marie Bledsoe Downs. I'm the Principal Deputy Solicitor and Acting Deputy Solicitor for Indian Affairs um, at the Department of Interior. Uh, prior to joining the administration, I worked for my tribe, the Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska, in tribal economic development at our corporation, Ho-Chunk Inc., and for my alma mater, Arizona State uh, University, the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. In another chapter of my life, I was also a tribal college president, and I got my bachelor's in education from Wayne State College in Wayne, Nebraska. Um, my husband, Brad, and I have two children, uh, Michaela and Zachary. Um, and I'm thrilled to be here with you today for this important uh, subject. As we all know, um, the First Lady announced a great initiative today on native languages, but there's still a lot of work to be done in upholding our trust and treaty responsibilities around education and native languages. Um, but, but we also have a lot of great, great successes, whether it be in Head Start to early childhood, um, to tribal colleges, there's a lot of great work being done, but we've also got a long way to go. And so our uh, goal today here is to talk about some of those challenges, some of the barriers, as well as the, some of the opportunities that the Biden Heritage Administration can take on to um, improve both native education outcomes for our students and native languages. Our format today is gonna be three questions. Um, the first question I will pose to all of our panelists who I'm gonna introduce to you here in a moment. Um, and the second question will be for a smaller subset of the panel as well as the third question. Um, but I invite all of our leaders who are joining us here today to um, make sure that this is a dialogue with both of our cabinet members. There are well over probably 100 staff members from across num numerous federal agencies listening in today. And so this is an opportunity to really engage with those staff members and our cabinet members and make sure that the agenda that uh, goes forward is um, set by tribal leaders and by Indian country. So with that, let me turn to um, introductions. First, someone who needs no introduction, Secretary Deb Howland um, from the U.S. Department of Interior. Secretary Howland is the 54th U.S. Secretary of the Interior and the first Native American cabinet member. She previously served as the chair of the New Mexico Democratic Party from 2015 uh, to 2017 and as the U.S. Representative for New Mexico's first congressional district from 2019 to 21. She's one of the first, first two Native American women elected to the U.S. Congress, and she's an enrolled member of the Laguna Pueblo. She and her husband, Skip, have one child, Soma Holland. Next, we have Secretary Miguel Cardona. He's prior to serving as Secretary of Education, Secretary Cardona served as the Connecticut Commissioner of Education since 2019. In 2003, at the age of 27, he was named principal of the Hanover School in Meridian, Connecticut, making him the youngest principal in the state. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree in education from Central Connecticut State University and a Master of Science in Bilingual and Bicultural Education at the University of Connecticut. Secretary Cardona and his wife Marissa have two children, Celine and Miguel Jr. Now for my tribal leaders. First, I'd like to introduce Chief Executive Mel Melanie Benjamin from the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. She was first elected Chief in Executive in 2000 and was re-elected in 2004, 8, and 12 and also 2016. She has served as Senior Vice President of Administration Finance at the Grand Casino Hinckley and as Interim Director of Pine Grove Leadership Academy. She is also a past Secretary and Vice Chair at the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe. She graduated from Bemidji State University and obtained her Master's from the University of Duluth. She has a daughter, Clayton, and is a proud grandmother of 11 grandchildren. Next, I'd like to introduce you to Cheryl Andrew Maltese. Cheryl is the chairwoman of the Wampanoag Tribe of Gay Hedequina and is serving her fourth term. The tribe is located on Nuepe, the island of Martha's Vineyard off the east coast of Massachusetts. Before being re-elected re as chairwoman, Ms. Maltese was Obama presidential appointee and served as the first tribal leader to become a senior advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. She and her husband Daniel have been happily married for 29 years and they have a daughter, Samantha. Next, Principal Chief Huskin Jr. Chief Hoskin was elected to serve as Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation in 2019. He previously served as the Cherokee Nation Secretary of State and, and as a member of the Council of the Cherokee Nation. Chief Hoskin has testified in front of the United Nations on behalf of the Cherokee Nation and serves on multiple boards and commissions. He graduated from the University of Oklahoma and the University of Oklahoma College of Law. 
He and, the, his first, he and the First Lady January are parents of two children, Tristan and Jasmine. And last but not least, Chairman Aaron Payment. Chairman Payment from the Sault Ste. Marie tribe is a chair, has been chair, and was first elected to his position in 2004. He returned to serve additional terms in 2012, 16, and 20. And prior to serving as chair, he served as the tribal vice chair for two terms and served in the tribal legislature for eight years. A high school dropout at 15, Payment holds a doctorate degree in education, a master's in education specialist, and a master's in education administration and in public administration. He has previously served as president of the BIE Tribal Grant School and as university faculty and Native American student retention for, as coordinator at several different universities. Thank you all for joining me today and in, um, to discuss this important topic. I'd like to go ahead and get right into it with our first question. It's a pretty broad question, and the hope is here that you'll set some uh, priorities for the administration and talk about some of the experiences you have in your tribal communities. So Chairman Payment, I'm gonna start with you, and the question is this. How can the Biden-Harris administration improve educational opportunities for Native students and their families? Chairman Payment? Ani Buju to Secretaries Holland and Cardona, distinguished panelists, education advocates, and tribal leaders across Native America. For centuries, the federal government's relationship with tribes has been guided by a treaty and trust obligation to honor our rights. Of the 374 treaties spanning most tribal nations, about a third contain education provisions. Put simply, the exchange for over 500 million acres of Indian land established the perpetual responsibility for Indian education. This responsibility makes it essential that the federal government increase accountability and academic achievement at all levels for Native students in the public schools, as well as the BIE schools. 93% of Native students attend public schools with more than half attending K-12 schools in our nation's large urban centers. So it's important to recognize the diverse needs of all Native students everywhere. My main recommendation is that the federal government raise the academic profile and success of all Native students through a higher level commitment to Indian education. So how is the federal government doing in fulfilling the treaty obligation for education? First, it's important to contextualize the worst of the worst outcomes experienced by Native students as explained by federal removal and reservation policies, Indian boarding schools and forced assimilation and the resulting historical and intergenerational trauma. Lumbee researcher Dr. Brian Brayboy's tribal critical race theory explains that these factors led to social and economic adversity and a lack of equitable opportunity for our people. These conditions explain the stark and persisting disparities between Native and Caucasian students as documented in the 2018 U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Broken Promises report. Educational attainment for Native students persists as the lowest of any racial ethnic group. Disproportionately, Native students experience lower reading and math proficiency, low test scores, and less access to high rigor courses. Again, the high school dropout rate for Natives is highest um, among any racial ethnic group. For Native Americans, it is uh, men, Native American young men, it's 13% versus 7%. For Native young women, it is 10% versus 5%. This is nearly twice the dropout rate for Natives. Data also shows only 17% of Native students began college last year compared to 62%. It's hard to reconcile the treaty obligation for education with the worst of the worst outcomes. Therefore, I recommend the appointment of an Assistant Secretary of Indian Education. This is supported by NCAI, NIEA, NACI, and was requested by tribal leaders during the most recent Department of Education consultation. An Assistant Secretary level position would provide clear commitment, critical leadership, accountability, and collaboration at a necessary level to fulfill the treaty obligation for education. Similar senior administrative posts exist like the Assistant Secretary of Interior, Indian Affairs and IHS Director, which hold the rank of ES5. While the BIE does a fair job for the 7% who attend BIE schools, the remaining 93% deserve no less. An Assistant Secretary would have the greater latitude to ensure oversight and cross-cutting teamwork in the Department of Ed in federal title equity program implementation and in collaboration with the White House Indian Education Initiative. As a high school dropout, I also recommend a new federally funded effort to more pointedly aid those who dropped out to drop back in, as the treaty and trust obligation for education doesn't end at the high school doors. Finally, for the last five years, the executive director for the White House Initiative for Indian Education has not been permanently filled, and I request that you please consider making that appointment immediately. Jamie Gwitch. 
Thank you very much, Chairman Payment. Really appreciate those comments and important um, uh, insight into the number of students who are in public schools as well as the dropout rates. Um, I'm now going to turn to Chief Hoskin for um, a response to that question or opening comments. What do and OCO everyone, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. I appreciate uh, the, both the secretaries making time today and I appreciate the Biden-Harris administration bringing back the White House Tribal Nations Conference. This is welcome after a four year hiatus. This topic is critically important because the investments we make today in education uh, will determine how successful we are in the future. That's true of any people around the world. It's certainly true in Indian country. I know it's true in the Cherokee Nation. Let me share with you a bit about what we're doing at the Cherokee Nation to make that investment ourselves. We recently announced that we would put $40 million into early, early childhood education. So we're going to replace all of our Head Start centers across our reservation because we know that getting uh, a good education at an early age makes a difference. We know that Head Start works. Uh, we know that early education works. So those efforts are underway at the Cherokee Nation, uh, and we're very proud of that. We also understand that Within our reservation, most young people, most young Cherokees go to Oklahoma public schools. Uh, and so we have in the last decade continually stepped up to support public education in the form of funding, in the form of the in-kind services. We really view education as something that everyone in the community has a stake in. And we're putting resources into that. We're showing leadership in that regard. And so we challenge state leaders and we challenge federal leaders to continue to put money into public education. What we've seen from the Biden-Harris administration so far is a very good sign uh, that that investment is going to not only continue, but to increase. And that's good for the Cherokee people. One uh, particular important piece of our education system is the Sequoia Schools. This is a school that we operate using Bureau of Indian Education funds and running that school can be a challenge. At Cherokee Nation, we're fortunate to have the resources that we could invest mightily into Sequoia Schools. And many young people go and get their education there. We want it to be the school of choice for Cherokees in the region. Uh, and we've made it that way. Part of the way we've made it that way is to invest in capital improvements. But there is a barrier, and I think the Biden-Harris administration could help us with that barrier. Today, we have buildings that are, in some cases, 50 years old, 75 years old, even 100 years old. If we replace those facilities with modern buildings, even using our own resources, we may find that in the modern landscape of education, we need to create bigger buildings. We need to design different buildings. You know, certainly we learned during the pandemic that when it comes to a public health crisis, having the space to spread out is important. So we have to future plan in terms of how to operate these schools. The restriction we have right now, though, is that the dollars that the Bureau of Indian Education will provide in terms of operating expenses is severely limited by square footage that, frankly, uh, a bureaucracy in Washington, D.C. is determined is best for Sequoia schools. We think there's ways to free us up from that. Now, it will take resources committed by the federal government, but it'll also take trust in the tribes to know how to chart a destiny when it comes to education, including investing in capital improvements at our own schools. We can do it. We can do it better than anyone, but we need the federal government to give us some additional flexibility. So that's one uh, point on which I would challenge the administration to take a look at, see how we can be more flexible with our Bureau of Indian Education schools, particularly those uh, that are operated by tribes, as is the case of the Cherokee Nation. We've proven in the healthcare context that when Cherokee Nation can design healthcare facilities, operate healthcare facilities, make sure the government of the United States keeps its obligation to provide funding, that we can provide the best healthcare. We know we can do that in education as well. So we're doing a lot of important things in education at the Cherokee Nation. I haven't even touched upon the efforts we're making in language. I know we'll, we'll touch on that later, uh, but I'm very proud of our efforts and looking forward to working with the Biden and Harris administration on more of these initiatives. Widow. Thank you very much, Chief Hoskin. I think uh, that is a great example of tribal self-governance at work, and we look forward to hearing more about that. It certainly sets an example. I'd now like to turn to Chief Executive Melanie Benjamin to offer some opening comments or thoughts on uh, what the Biden-Harris administration can do um, with regards to improving Native education. Uju Anin Anishinaabe Duk Mino Geji Gadnu Gum Mandaman and Dijnakaz Melanie Benjamin Indigo. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this panel. It's very impressive with the Biden administration and our tribal leaders that we have and how talented 
and educated and in tune with the necessary requirements we need at the tribal level. And uh, many of the tribal leaders so far talked about a couple of the items I had on my list, so I won't reiterate those. But one of the things I was thinking about too is the mental health support services. And when I think about that, it's making sure that we do have mental health services for our young learners. And that way we can be assured that we are taking the necessary mandates to support the whole child and set them up for success by giving them to giving them tools to overcome obstacles, connect with their teachers and parents, their peers in a healthy way and to self-regulate. And I think that's very important. Um, Chairman Payment talked about 93% of our, our children go to public schools. And when I think about that, there's sometimes, especially in our area at Mille Lacs Band, that uh, the school districts don't really necessarily understand the tribal governments and how we operate. And they look to us as a funding source to take care of the Indian stuff at their schools. Mm -hmm. uh, for a lack, uh, I wanted to stress that because that's how sometimes they talk about that. But I think uh, one of the things that's very important is to have professional, professional development and training for the school boards at these school districts because they need to know a little bit about Indian country and federal Indian law and some of the policies at the federal level, how tribes and the federal government work together on educational issues. And it would really be a good um, education for these school boards that a lot of times have no connection to Indian people whatsoever, more so the Indian student. And I think that would help quite a bit as well. And uh, we always talk about, we want the ability to educate our own children, even though parents do choose to put their kids in public schools. But to have that opportunity to use our ability as sovereigns to, to self-govern our own education and making sure that we connect to our kids in the manner that they understand. And a lot of times I think that there's such a huge communication gap between, especially in our area, the uh, non-Indian and the American Indians. And by having that additional education for the adult and the students, non-Indian students in the school can really bridge that gap. And we can start to really work better together and making sure that our children are educated in the best possible way. But then we can also use our expertise to educate the non-Indian students as well. Thank you, Chief Benjamin. I really appreciate that. Uh, you raise an important point about the impact of uh, mental health services, especially um, during this pandemic and all the impact it's had on our students um, and our faculty um, and administrators as well. Um, I'd now like to turn to uh, Chairwoman Andrews Maltese um, for her opening comments. Cheryl Andrews Maltese, and I'm the Chairwoman of the Wampanoag Tribe of Gay Head of Quina on the island of Nopi, now known as Martha's Vineyard. I'd also like to thank President Biden and Vice President Harris and the White House Council on Native American Affairs for reinstituting this very important Tribal Nations Summit. And thank you, Secretary Hallen and Card Cardona for participating in this forum with us. As the Wampanoag people, we're the first people that met the uh, pilgrims back in 1620. With the original signatories to the first, first treaty signed in this hemisphere, the 1621 Treaty of Peace, and we are also the first resistance that was led against the encroachments of our lands and our natural resources. That we're here today, 400 years later, is just a testament, <clears throat> excuse me, to our courage, strength, and resiliency. I'm thankful to my ancestors and to all of those who came before me who made it possible for us to be here today. And we're here to learn from the past, to correct it in the present, and to provide a brighter pathway and life for our people in the future. When we talk about education, education is very, has been a critical component for our people since the early days. The first two graduates from the first college in this hemisphere, Caleb Chita Miomuk, as well as Joel Hayakum, both graduated from Harvard College in 1665. Our education has been important to us since those times. However, at what cost? 
in order for the school to get the funding and for our people to continue to be educated, taken from our homes and educated in colonial schools, we had to acculturate. We had to give up who we are, who we are, how we look at the world, being Indians, dressing, practicing our culture, practicing our heritage and our religion. This doesn't need to be the case today. Our tribe has been at the forefront of education for centuries, and yet we still struggle with the fact that we don't have our own school. Our tribe, as Dr. Payment had mentioned, as well as Chief Hodgkins, as well as Chief Executive Benjamin had mentioned, most of our students, over 90%, attend public schools and they don't attend Indian schools or tribal schools out of the BIE. Under no circumstance would we ever want funding to be diminished or taken away from the BIE schools or begrudge any tribally uh, run our own colleges or schools to be their funding to be diminished. However, 93% of our native students are in a public school system, but we're not getting that financial support for our students. That's where we have to take a new look. That's where we need to um, appoint a secretary of Indian education we have to have a complete Indian office within the Department of Education to better understand the impacts and implications of what this means. In the context of our histories, we are as diverse in our regions, in our tribes, and with our, our educational needs as we are between the 574 tribes that there are federally recognized. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we look at some of the issues that we're, look, um, that we're trying to address today, Tribally designated and defined and developed Head Start programs, daycare, after school programs, tutoring, tutoring web-based enrollment of urban students to access tribal schools so that they have that greater experience connecting with their tribal counterparts that they may not be able to do. But if we have broadband support, if the tribes are connected, we can introduce our tribal students from all over the country to learn and share their not only their experiences, but their culture and their heritage, as well as their education components, based upon how the tribes themselves want to do that. We need to focus even more on trade schools for our students. Not every student wants to go to a four-year bricks and mortar to get a degree. Some people want to get out into the workforce, but they can't do that because there's no support to be able to go to those trade schools and to get the certification and the licensure necessary to earn a living and to be uh, part of their community right out of the gates. More funding from the Department of Education for federally recognized tribes that goes directly to the tribes. Unlike the impact aid, which we need to revamp and revisit, unlike the Title VI, that has also got a lot of restrictions. These programs are a good starting point but without having the tribal voices of the tribal leadership to help design those programs where it's going to make sense in our own communities, we're lacking, we're falling short. So I don't want to take up too much time because I know we have other questions and discussions to have, but we really do need to look at how we base these formula grants. Um, cost of living and cost of services have to be factored in. What it costs to educate a student on Martha's Vineyard is not the same that it costs to educate a student in other places of the country. Even in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts itself, our students um, span the entire globe, <laughs> well, the entire country, lower 48, Alaska and Hawaii. So each and every student in our community has their own learning experience, but that doesn't mean that they should not be ex expected to have equal support from my tribal nation and from the United States because we paid it forward with the lives of our ancestors, our lands and our natural resources. It's a trust and treaty obligation to all tribes that the United States owes us. And we're here to help make that a reality and bring that to where it needs to be so that we can better meet that obligation for all tribal nations. Thank you again. And I look forward to a broader discussion. Thank you, Chairwoman Andrews Maltese, um, and thank you to all the tribal leaders uh, for your feedback and your comments. Um, I'll turn to Secretary Hallen and Secretary Cardona here in a moment. Um, I think I've heard a number of things that I'd invite both of you um, to share thoughts or feedback on, or if you have additional um, input that you'd like to give um, at this time, everything from the impact of COVID-19, operational funding, 
um, the impact of uh, schools as, as tools of assimilation on our communities, um, investments in public school, the importance of vocational education, the importance of early childhood and Head Start education, um, the value of tri tribal self-governance, um, as well as dropout rates and, and um, other uh, impacts on our students. So, um, Secretary Holland, I will open it up to you. Th thank you so much, Anne-Marie. And it's so nice to see all of you, my friends um, uh, in Indian country. I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. And, you know, we'll start here, that the Biden-Harris administration has made already made historic investments in Indian country. Uh, by supporting key measures that um, tribal nations asked for in the beginning of this administration. Um, we're working toward a better nation to nation engagement that includes uh, this administration uh, strengthening tribal self-governance. So um, I appreciate and I'm proud to be a part of this um, administration. Um, and, and President Biden has been there for a long, long time. One of his first votes as a U.S. Senator was to support the passage of the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act. I know that Indian issues are top of mind for him and they have been for a very, very long time. Um, one of the things that President Biden instructed all of us on when we first came into these roles uh, was that tribal consultation is going to be a priority for him uh, and this administration. So we've worked very hard uh, thus far to make sure that tribes are part of the conversation. And that is uh, before we make decisions, right? It hasn't always worked that way. Uh, I know through the decades, uh, decisions have been made and then tribal leaders uh, try to, uh, you know, ch change things after the fact. But we want to make sure that your input uh, is there before those decisions are made. Um, and, as, and for my part, uh, being the, the uh, Secretary of the Interior, um, my mom spent 25 years working in Indian education. She, back then, um, they didn't have the BIE. But she was um, an a, a employee, a career employee of the BIA, uh, started out as a teacher's aide, uh, worked as a secretary at an elementary school in Isleta Pueblo, um, and uh, retired while she was an office manager for the superintendent of ed Indian education uh, for the Southwest region. Uh, she was in charge of student count, um, really cared deeply about all of uh, the students that they serviced. And uh, I saw that every single day of my growing up. And so I, I know um, and understand how important it is uh, to her, it was to her. Um, and, to, and now I understand how important it is to the folks, uh, my colleagues at the Department of the Interior and the BIE. So um, I want you to know that I will always support Indian education. I'm happy to hear your perspectives today. Um, I think that also with the passage of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, that we'll have a real opportunity to resolve the longstanding digital divide in Indian country. Um, it's sad to think that there are still some tribes in the United States of America who are using dial-up. Um, uh, to be able to connect to the outside world. And so uh, the time, it's way past due that we ensure that every child has opportunities to connect digitally, um, that, um, that uh, inter broadband internet service is a reality for everyone across the country. Um, earlier this year, I was very proud to join Vice President Harris uh, uh, and the Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, for an announcement of $1 billion uh, for the Tribal Broadband Connectivity Program so that tribes could build infrastructure and set up wireless networks on tribal lands. That will be extremely important as it moves forward. The new infrastructure package goes even further uh, and adds another $2 billion to Tribal Broadband uh, Connectivity Program. And I think that will just make a tremendous difference. Um, additionally, President Biden announced his new executive order to advance educational equity for Native Americans in tribal colleges and universities in October. And I, I really feel like um, this is a new era for tribes. And uh, just, as, just as, you know, this is our first uh, White House Tribal Nations Summit, 
Um, next year, when we connect at this about the same time, I look forward to us having conversations about what went so right and and where we are uh, in moving all of these things forward. Um, I am uh, very proud to serve in this administration. Um, I also want to just highlight very quickly uh, the work at the department that we are doing. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to move forward um, in this new era. It's also another to recognize uh, our past, and I don't think we can ever forget our past. And so I was very proud um, as the Secretary of the Interior to announce our Indian Boarding School, uh, Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative. Uh, we want families to be able to heal from that terrible, terrible time, that terrible era of uh, assimilation policies here in our country. Um, and, and I think that goes along with all of the other things we're doing, right? Land into trust and uh, economic development and opportunities for students when they graduate. We, we want to make sure that we, are, uh, that we are touching on these issues, but also um, that we're doing it in a way that, you know, essentially puts our arms around these kids from the time they start school to the time they're ready to take their first job after college and beyond. So uh, there's lots of work to do, Anne-Marie, and uh, I'm excited uh, for the road ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Holland. I really appreciate that. Thank you for your leadership um, in the announcement of the boarding school initiative. Thank you for your uh, mother's uh, contributions to Indian education over the years. Um, we are so grateful for the rich history your family has um, on these issues and, and what you're doing um, as we go forward. Um, I'll now turn to Secretary Cardona for uh, thoughts and feedback um, on things that have come up thus far or other topics. Sure, thank you very much, uh, Anne-Marie. Glad to be here, um, honored to be a part of this panel. And um, quite frankly, I'm honored to be serving at a time where we have our first Native American secretary. Uh, Deb Holland is uh, not only a colleague, but someone that I uh, look forward to continuing to work with. And uh, I said it publicly at the uh, first cabinet meeting, uh, how honored I am to, to serve alongside you and uh, how lucky we are as a nation. Uh, I, I heard many great comments and I appreciate the perspective and I want to share uh, with a sense of optimism that while this is a summit, this is an event, this partnership that we're going to have is going to continue to be strong. I need your input continuously and I want to make sure you hear from me directly that it will impact the work that we do at the department um, and that it's important that we maintain that open line of communication so that we can serve uh, uh, tribal students uh, well. And as uh, the chair, uh, Chairman Payman uh, mentioned, 93% of the students in our, uh, of, of Native American students are in our public schools. It's critically important that we provide good programming for them there as well, um, and that we continue to raise the bar so they can continue to have success. Um, we're guided by the executive order signed on October 11th in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, that acknowledges the role that the Department of Education has in supporting Native American communities all across the country. And what that means is that we're ensuring that Native American students have access to qualified, diverse educators and school leaders and other education professionals who understand Native American culture, understand their, their lived experiences, and work uh, explicitly to contrast what the history has shown of assimilation in our schools. We need to embrace, I recall conversations with students when I visited uh, Saginaw Chap uh, Chippewa, for example, uh, where the student said, when I feel seen, I do better. When I'm respected for what I bring to the table, I feel more a part of the community. That's important across the country that we do that. And it's our responsibility to do that in a culturally responsive way look at our students, our Native American students as assets. And being bilingual and bicultural is the greatest asset you can bring to the table. We need to acknowledge that across. It also means we are gonna strengthen our commitment at the Department of Education uh, by empowering the roles of tribal education agencies in public education and our tribal colleges and universities as well. Making sure that uh, we, we, we stand behind uh, 
tribal sovereignty and self-determination and what that means. And yes, it's our responsibility, as was mentioned earlier, to make sure that all students have social and emotional well-being, to make sure that uh, we follow through on what I heard from uh, our students, uh, tribal education students, to say this pandemic really affected us significantly, not only in broadband access, but also um, from the perspective perspective of needing more mental health supports. So we have to make sure that we reopen and reimagine schools with that at the foundation. Um, and we're listening, and we're gonna continue to listen at the agency. And I'll just close by saying that one of the other things that we heard while we were on, on the road and visiting tribal schools is that uh, when we think about American Rescue Plan funds and how we're reopening schools, we must get to those issues that are really important to tribal countries as well. And those issues might be different. I heard infrastructure brought up before and how we're looking at flexibilities. We need to listen to make sure that the support that we're providing is aimed at what you're telling us we, we need to hear. So you'll have my commitment that I'll continue to do that, not only at this summit uh, with the great ideas that were mentioned, but as long as I'm secretary with a strong partnership with the Department of Education. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Cardona, I really appreciate that. Thank you for your commitment um, to tribal sovereignty and tribal self-determination, um, and for your visit to Indian country. Um, it's really important that our leaders get out and hear from um, tribal leaders and tribal communities um, directly, so I really appreciate that. Um, so we've already had um, a, pretty, a pretty rich uh, a list of things that are left to be discussed. Um, I do wanna take a moment, however, and um, talk about an exciting uh, topic of the day, and that's native language uh, preservation and uh, revitalization. So um, I will start with the, the question, what should the administration know about tribal efforts to preserve and revitalize native language, and how can the administration support those efforts? Um, and I know there's some really unique things happening out at the Cherokee Nation, and I might turn first to Principal Chief Hoskin to talk a little bit about that and perhaps pose additional questions. Wado, and, and first of all, thank you for addressing this topic. This is so critical. Um, at Cherokee Nation, when we take our oath of office, uh, we pledge to, of course, uh, uh, protect and defend the Cherokee Nation Constitution, but part of that is to do everything in our effort as elected officials uh, to preserve the culture, heritage, and traditions of the Cherokee people. And you can't uh, protect and preserve the culture without uh, preserving and really revitalizing the Cherokee language. Here's what we're up against, and this is a familiar story across Indian country. Uh, we have 400,000 citizens in the Cherokee Nation. We only have about 2,000 fluent speakers, most of them over the age of 70. Now, our language has suffered over the centuries from a variety of different foes, from genocide, from war, from dispossession, from forced removal. But I'll tell you today, the worst foe that we have is the fragility of human life and the passage of time, given those statistics I just shared with you. So what are we doing at the Cherokee Nation? Well, we're committing historic resources, our own resources, to save this language. I proposed in our council pa pass the Durban Feeling Language Act in 2019, named after Durban Feeling, the great, greatest language warrior for the Cherokee people since Sequoia invented the syllabary 200 years ago this year, by the way. Uh, we put $16 million into putting all of our language programs under one roof, expanding the language programs that work the best. For example, our, our immersion program for kids, we've just acquired new property to open a second campus so that young people who are the best at learning any language uh, can have more of an opportunity to do that. Really, the hopes of saving the language really are in the hands of these young people. But we also need to educate uh, a number of teachers now. So how are we doing that? We have a master apprentice program uh, for adults, very intense two-year program so we can create teachers and we can create people that can go use the language in other aspects of life, including the creative arts. We have to give an opportunity for people to earn a living having learned the language. But putting resources into our programs, into strategies and again, programs that work is the way we are going to save this language. We're also doing other things. We're looking at this population of fluent speakers and understanding that we've got to take care of their needs so they can live a good quality of life. Housing is one way we can help our elders across Indian country. When we can combine housing opportunities and situate that housing near language learning centers for young people, 
what we can do is create a language community. And we're doing that at the Cherokee Nation. We're creating a language center. Next door to it is a village for elders who are fluent speakers. As we move along this project, we'll see this vibrant language community in the Cherokee Nation, uh, and it'll help us uh, go further in our efforts to save our language. There's a whole lot more to be done. We have a lot of language programs from translation, again, to some exciting things in the creative arts. I'm impressed with the leadership of the Biden-Harris administration and what I've seen in Congress. Congress has a bill called the Durban Feeling Language Act, which will help native languages across the country. I certainly encourage support uh, for that piece of legislation. And of course, this administration has already made great strides and I know uh, is getting agencies together within the executive branch to do even more on native languages. We need more resources, all of those strategies and mm -hmm. programs that I outlined from the Cherokee Nation. We can take them further if we get a, a dish, additional resources from the federal government. We can also share best practices across tribes. We can see what works. We know a lot of other tribes out there are doing a lot of great work. The more we can get together in a collaborative way, and not just among tribes, but also with our federal partners, and match that with resources, we can save these language. I think it's the least the United States can do to make sure it steps up to help us save these languages. Once we lose these, we lose a core part of our identity. This is a mission at the Cherokee Nation we take very serious. We will not fail on this mission. Any help we can get from the government of the United States is appreciated. We're going to plow ahead with them. Thank you very much, Principal Chief Hoskin. I really appreciate that. And thank you for sharing a very innovative and forward-leaning approach that you're taking um, at Cherokee Nation. Um, and you're so right. Um, you know, we know that um, as we um, infuse tribal language and tribal culture into the curriculum, uh, student outcomes improve. Um, and to think about what it also means for others in our community um, and the holistic approach you're taking is, is really encouraging. So with that, Secretary Howland, I might turn to you to offer some um, opportunities to reflect or, or comments on, on what you've heard so far. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Chief Hoskin, and thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, language is everything. It's everything. It is, uh, it's the land, it's the people, it's the relationships that we have with our family members, uh, with our clan relatives, with um, you know, children who are born into um, our communities. Um, language uh, means a tremendous amount. And of course, it's important uh, to make sure that we are um, teaching um, uh, children uh, so that for generations to come, um, our languages will be there. Um, uh, today is November 15th, and uh, it's the 30th anniversary of the Code Talkers Recognition Act. Uh, and that act recognizes the service of Native American Code Talkers for their native language communication assignments that they were given in both World Wars I and II. And um, imagine this for a second. Um, of course, we're indebted to our veterans always. Um, but think about this. At the same time that Native American veterans were um, helping our country uh, to ensure democracy into the future, um, our children and our communities were part of some of the most horrible assimilation policies in this country. And as I mentioned earlier, federal Indian boarding schools. And um, so I think it's significant that, um, that we recognize that, um, that we have some work to do. Um, we're so grateful to our veterans for all the work they have done. Uh, the languages to help win World War II in 1945. Um, and so uh, I think we're, with respect to native languages, we put it in that context, of course, it becomes even more important. Um, you know, my grandparents were part of, were, were essentially victims of the boarding school era, as well as my mom. And one of the reasons that I don't speak my language fluently um, is because my mother uh, had terrible experiences um, with, uh, with being reprimanded um, in violent ways whenever she spoke her language at school. And so even though our children aren't experiencing that, I think there's a reticence for some uh, folks to practice their language, um, 
you know, that it seems uh, there's some sort of generational trauma about that, that we need to help our students overcome. And certainly um, I need to overcome it myself. And so um, I think we have a lot of work to do. And one of the ways we can absolutely do that is to make sure that uh, throughout the country we are supporting um, those native languages. And, and of course, we, we can put all the, all the support of the federal government behind these programs. Um, it will be you, tribal leaders. It will be your, um, your cultural uh, and religious um, uh, leaders of your communities who will help to move these programs forward. And while these language programs won't fully restore um, the past efforts to eliminate our indigenous languages during uh, the various eras of our country, I think it's a step in the right direction. I want you all to know that for our part, the Department of the Interior stands ready to support every opportunity to ensure that, um, that children and even adults <laughs> like myself um, have those opportunities to learn their languages. Um, and uh, someone said uh, in this summit already, it's never too late uh, to learn uh, your language. So um, I appreciate everything that all of you do every single day to ensure that this important issue moves forward. And I know that this administration uh, will be as supportive as we possibly can. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Secretary Holland. I really appreciate that. Um, Chief Hoskin is right. There's a lot we can do as partners, but your point is well made. There's a lot we can do individually to make sure um, we're doing everything we can to uh, preserve and uh, revitalize our language. I, I myself have, have a similar story and toyed with the idea of introducing myself with my Ho-Chunk name today, but wasn't sure I would get it quite right and hesitated, and I, and I regret that. It's, it's all about um, trying, right? Um, and uh, so I really, really appreciate that. I'd like to turn now to uh, Chief Benjamin to offer some um, thoughts on some of the things that she's doing in her community. What I, I think about uh, the teaching from our elders and what they tell us that we were given gifts from the money due. And one of those gifts is our language. And within that language, we have everything that we need to be good people, to, to lead a good life. And I, I think about all of those ceremonies that are done in Ojibwe for us, and they start at birth and they end when we enter the spirit world. And when you look at all that language and all those teachings and values and all those that are entailed in that language, they're not able to be translated into mm -hmm. English because the meaning is so deep. And so it's so important that we do continue to utilize our gift of language that were given to us by the, the money duel. And so what we're doing at Mille Lacs, we've had many um, Ojibwe speaking initiatives over the years, um, master apprentice programs, uh, programs at the schools, and uh, we continue to evolve and come up with uh, new ways to um, bring that revitalization of the language back to the people. So one of the um, recent projects that we've been working on is that we published five monolingual Ojibwe language books. And those were created in the last couple of years. And so we had 17 fluent speakers join second language speakers and linguists to storyboard, to build content and edit hundreds of stories that were organized into different areas. And building these resources are so imperative to making sure that we as Anishinaabe have that knowledge to be able to utilize our gifts and our responsibilities that are embedded in our languages. And so I'm very excited about that. And I don't think we could have did this project without, of course, the commitment of our uh, first speakers, language speakers at Mille Lacs. And we've also had a valued partnership 
with the Minnesota Historical Society Press. One of the other exciting projects that we have is called the Rosetta Stone Ojibwe. So mm -hmm. we've been working on this for the last couple of years. And um, of course, when the pandemic hit, that uh, stopped a lot of the process for about a year, but we continued with that. And so we have a, a strategic planning committee for the language revitalization. And we explored all the options of the technology to make sure that we could continue this project. And uh, we have our first training program with uh, Rosetta Stone getting ready to be um, presented to our community. And the goal of this is to, we give it out to our tribal members first, but then we want to open it up through the state of Minnesota and to the region. And of course, our dialect is going to be a little different from Michigan, but uh, they will be, be able to fine tune that for their own, uh, their own ways. But I think that's very important too, is that when we think about the language, it has everything that we need. It has our teachings. It has our culture value systems in there. And uh, when we don't know our language, we're missing that. And the importance of uh, making sure that we revitalize the language. And I'm very proud of many of our elders. We had so many uh, fluent speakers here at the Mille Lacs Band. And we had people from all over the, uh, the state of Minnesota and the region and even Canada come to Mille Lacs to learn that language. And our elders shared that. And I think uh, what we wanna do is to share our knowledge and then you take it back home and you perfect it for your region. And having that ability to have that partnership with Rosetta Stone is giving us a really quick start to, to making sure that we continue that education of our language and making sure that our people are always Anishinaabe and they think Anishinaabe as well. And so I think that's very important. So very exciting and can't wait to share it uh, with, with many and even the books uh, that are uh, written in Ojibwe. So you're gonna have to take your Rosetta Stone training to be able to read the books in Ojibwe. <laughs> so very exciting and, and I'm, um, very proud that we had the opportunity to uh, utilize funding for that. And um, we, of course, uh, contribute our own Mille Lacs Band funding as well to make sure this language re revitalization is a huge success and a priority. That's wonderful. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that example. And I think the one thing um, that we, we've heard today is there's so many really um, innovative and great projects happening already in Indian country because we know how important this is to our communities um, and finding ways for the federal partners to participate and um, um, invest in those same initiatives is really, really critical. Um, so thank you for that. And we have, we're, we're running a little low on time. I'm gonna go to our third question before we open it up to a couple tribal audience questions. Um, and this question is around uh, for Secretary Cardona and a couple of our other, other tribal leaders. Um, and we've heard the data already a couple times this, um, this afternoon that 93% of our students are in public schools. Um, so how can the administration better support those native students who are in public schools? And I know Chairman Payment, you have some thoughts on this. Um, I'd like to turn to you for um, a response to that. Yeah, so uh, if you can hear me, there are two federal actions in the 1970s that modernized our uh, federal commitment uh, to Indian education. One was the creation of the National Advisory Council on Indian Education, or NACI, in 1972. And the other one you already heard earlier, it was the enactment of the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act of 1975. There's been presidential memo after memo that reaffirm uh, the federal commitment to Indian education. Uh, President Biden's executive order on the White House Indian Education Initiative aspires to transcend and transform Indian education. It enhances the role of NACI to facilitate collaboration under the Department of Education with linkages to both the Department of Interior and the Department of Labor. President Biden's proclamation designating the nation's first Indigenous Peoples Day promotes an insight into our role in American history by saying, we must never forget the centuries long campaign of violence, displacement, assimilation, and terror wrought on native communities and tribal nations. President Biden's White House initiative further recognized the impact of Indian boarding schools by acknowledging their effects and resulting trauma reverberate native communities even today, and that we 
acknowledge the significant sacrifices made by Native people to this country and recognize their many ongoing contributions to our nation. So consistent with the Every Student Succeeds Act, the president's commitment prioritizes the need to advance Indigenous languages and assessment and full implementation of Native curricula that seek the truth and celebrates the contributions of Indian people, like the Iroquois Confederacy Great Law of Peace as the scaffolding in the U.S. Constitution. While the Obama administration, um, Obama uh, Biden administration did extensive work on school climate, the Biden administration should update and publish the more than mascot findings. It's time to end this racist practice of singling out Native people to such derogatory depictions in sports. According to President Biden, the federal government must put strong focus on early childhood and K-12 educational opportunities. These are important to developing and strengthening Native communities, and they set the stage for educational advancement and career development, including opportunities to attend tribal colleges and universities. So in Indian education, New Deal is needed to expand opportunity, starting with eliminating income eligibility for tribal Head Start, providing free tuition at tribal colleges, easing access to Pell Grant, and lessening and erasing loan burdens that American Indians have a federal right to an education. If historical and intergenerational trauma explain the worst of the worst outcomes, a return to our culture and our language and a positive orientation to our role in history should revitalize and heal tribal communities. I recommend a new supplemental virtual education track and access to a library of digital lessons to reignite a pathway to education uh, for achievement for all. And finally, a shout out to Olympic champion Billy Mills who's watching. He texted me just now uh, and he's crafted an indigenous curriculum that he's uh, ready and willing to share. So Jamie Gritch. Thank you very much, Chairman Payment. Many of our heroes are watching right now. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mills, for joining in. I really appreciate that. I'm going to turn now to Secretary Cardona, to Terry Cardona, for um, some thoughts and feedback on all the uh, issues you raised, uh, Chairman Payment. Thank you very much, and Chairman Payment. I think the amount of quality recommendations you made is Olympic time too. So I have to give you credit where credit is due. Look. We have work to do, and, and I would just want to go back to the, the previous question. Language revitalization combats assimilation, um, and we must recognize that we're all at different levels. I'm a second language learner myself, and in my attempts to, to speak Spanish, even if it's, it's not as strong as my parents, is an affirmation of the bilingualism and the biculturalism that I bring. And it's our role as educators to help our students understand that that is their superpower. That is their superpower. So uh, although it may not be as crisp and clear as my parents' Spanish, it, it is an affirmation of who I am and um, my, my culture, my biculturalism is what I call it. So, you know, it, it's something that I, as I listen to you, I think it's our responsibility uh, as educators to make sure our students feel seen, mm -hmm. that they feel heard, that they feel affirmed, that our schools are not only reopen, but they're welcoming places where all students feel seen. Um, and we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. It's unacceptable that 17% of uh, Native American students uh, go to college where 62% is the, the average. That's unacceptable. We must maintain a level of urgency around fixing those issues. We must continue to communicate. We must share best practices. I, I'm taking notes during this, but I hope to have all of your written, uh, all of your comments in written form so that we can follow up at the Department of Education to make sure that we're lifting best practices that exist out there. We learn best from one another and I know the 574 recognized tribes have the answers that we need to lift better and we need to continue to partner. And we need to maintain that level of urgency that our president has shown uh, with this Build Back Better framework that focuses on early childhood education. We know we build skyscrapers with strong foundations. The same is true for education. And when we're talking about disparities and outcomes uh, in our Native American students not reaching the same levels as others, we need to make sure we focus on those things that we know work. Strong early childhood education, increase in Pell Grants so that more students have access to college, um, making sure that we're strengthening our career and technical education programs. And we have Amy Lloyd at the department. I'm really proud of the work that she's gonna be doing uh, at the agency to continue to push this work to give access to high paying, high quality jobs for many of our students who look at high school and say, what is my next path? Um, so there's tremendous work that we have to do to build a culturally relevant pedagogy so that, as I said earlier, our students feel seen. 
I recently spoke to a student uh, at Saginaw Chapawa who told me, you know, I was doing poorly uh, in a traditional school, but when I came to this tribal college, I felt seen, I felt heard. And it, it sparked in me a desire and a passion to learn. And I know that his success was because he felt that he was part of a community that welcomed him. We need to do that for all of our students in all of our schools. And because 93% of Native American students attend our public schools, it's critically important that we do a better job uh, making sure that our students feel seen and heard and that their parents feel seen and heard. And we talk a lot about self-determination. We need to make sure that the structures exist in our public school systems where our Native Americans feel that they have tribal sovereignty and self-determination there as well. Um, I'm committed not only to the strategies that our president laid out in this transformative bill, uh, uh, the Build Back Better framework, and, and ensuring that the American Rescue Plan funds are used in these coming years to address inequities that were made worse, like the inequities that we've heard about in our tribal uh, uh, country, where in our Indian country, where broadband uh, wasn't accessible, or the relational div divide that was exacerbated in tribal country because uh, of the spread of COVID. We need to make sure that we have the SEL supports, that we have broadband, broadband access to help give them the tools that they need to be successful uh, in their schools. And I'm committed to that, the department is committed to it. I'm also committed to making sure that we have stronger communication pathways so that we can hear the great ideas that are happening and we can hear the, the perspective of uh, uh, Indian country uh, across this nation to make sure that we're authentically embracing your thoughts and ideas uh, as we develop strategies moving forward. I look forward to that. Thank you much, very much, Secretary Cardona. Seen, heard, and affirmed. Yeah, more of that for sure. Um, I know we're running low on time, but I really want to uh, reach out to uh, Chairwoman Andrews Maltese. I know that you have thoughts on the question of how the administration can better support um, Native students who attend public schools. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. And I really appreciate um, the comments and all of the sentiment. And I won't repeat what has already been there. Um, just to articulate that it is really important when we're talking about the native languages being lost to us, four centuries worth of prohibition for us to be able to be who we are and have our language, lost a piece of us in that for those centuries. So being able to reintroduce um, funding for those types of programs that should go across the board for all tribes um, and stepping away from the grant formula, competitive grants amongst tribes to really develop a base funding that tribes can rely on to build a program from scratch if they need to, enhance a program that they currently have and or to be able to um, excel with the programs that they have. The other thing that is really important that I've noticed is that while we appreciate the support that is out there, most of this stuff has not been designated or designed for tribes. Um, it's predicated on an antiquated reservation system. I think by developing those communications, by having working groups, um, the tribal office and the secretary's uh, assistant secretary, and building in the flexibilities, having regional roundtables with, um, with the secretary and assistant secretaries with regard to education to be able to introduce what these ideas are and to truly commit to these quarterly roundtables, establishing benchmarks that we'll be able to measure the actionable items to receive feedback in real time regarding the effectiveness of the policies and the regulations that are being put forward for us. When we look at how um, we can move forward with elevating the awareness of Indian education in the public schools. It's imperative that our federal partners assist us with working with the states. And instead of having hodgepodges of uh, relationships with tribes within different states, to be able to create some sort of a uniformity so that when we're looking at um, states working with tribes, that the states understand that they too have an obligation to be working with the tribes and consulting with the tribes when they're developing their state curriculums. There's a lot of emphasis on how uh, education uh, for Indian people or Native American education in the school systems is important, and we appreciate and celebrate that, but it has to come from the tribes. We're the best teachers of our history. And therefore, by having us sitting at the tables, it, um, 
with these working groups and roundtables and working with the state education departments along with our federal partners is the best way that I can see a clearer pathway to providing elevated education as well as emphasizing the importance of trades and certifications on top of the four year, two year um, degree programs so that our students can get the best out of their education and enhance their lives for their own um, self-sufficiency as well. And thank you so very much for this opportunity to share our experience and our ideas to help build a better Indian educational system and support. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, I'm gonna quickly see if we have um, uh, Chief Ann Richardson um, in, in our holding room. Is she on and available for a question? Perhaps not. I'm gonna go ahead and turn to our other uh, tribal leader who had submitted a question for this panel. Um, that is Vice Chairman Johnny Hernandez, Vice Chairman from San Juan Manuel Band of uh, Mission Indians. Vice Chairman Hernandez, are you available? Yeah, I'm here. Welcome. Yay. Hi, good afternoon, Secretary Cardona and Secretary Holland. Thank you for today's panel discussion and taking our questions. Education in Indian country has advanced significantly over the past 50 years, tribes are more effective at educating their children through high school, but seem to run into challenges when our children pursue higher education, vocational education, and other post high school educational pursuits. Often it is the lack of uh, financial resources from tribes. What can the federal government do to assist tribes with higher education for our youth? Thank you for that question, Vice Chairman. I'll turn to Secretary Halland for a response. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Um, here I'd like to highlight the new interagency native language memorandum of agreement that was announced today. Um, this MOA creates an interagency working group to coordinate um, efforts from a whole of government approach to promote programs, including higher education, to identify best practices to further promote programs and projects that include instruction in and preservation of Native American languages. Additionally, the MOA calls for a National Native American Language Summit that will take place November 18th and 19th. And if you haven't registered for that event, I hope you will. Uh, further, the administration's Build Back Better plan um, uh, grants $200 million uh, included for grants for Native American language teachers and educators. Uh, that will be uh, a welcome opportunity as well. Um, very quickly, uh, because I know we're short on time, um, uh, I'd like to just say that uh, the Biden-Harris administration can also continue to support critical programs like the Esther Martinez Native American Languages Program to honor the legacy of Pueblo storyteller and self-taught linguist Esther Martinez from New Mexico. Um, and that promotes academic success by sustaining native languages and traditions. Um, and uh, last, Anne-Marie, before I turn it back to you, um, I really just want to thank all of the Indian education professionals who were listening today, the teachers, the teachers' aides, the language teachers, the cultural uh, teachers, the, 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 the parents who are, who are self-teaching their kids at home, especially during um, the COVID-19 um, pandemic that we've all been a part of over the last almost two years now. All of you are incredibly important in your children's lives and in their, um, in their education. So I wanna thank you all for being with us today and just know that we'll do our very best. Thank you, Secretary Halland. Well said. Uh, a huge shout out to all of the individual educators, parents, um, administrators, and staff at all of our schools um, across the country, whether they be BIE, public schools, higher education, or, or Head Start, um, and beyond. So um, I'm going to turn for final comments to my tribal leaders. Um, we are running over on time. You know, I, what do they say? You have one job, right? And I had one job to keep us to an hour. Um, I've not done that. Um, and so, um, but I would like to turn it over to you for very quick closing comments um, uh, on this panel. And I'll start with uh, Chief Executive Benjamin. Of course, I want to start out saying thank you to uh, the invite to be on the panel 
and Secretary Cordano and Secretary Holland. It was very uh, enlightening to listening to you. And it makes me excited about the opportunities that we have forward. And I wanted to say thank you to the tribal leaders. So they're, they're so talented and they have a lot of uh, knowledge to share for all of us. So I'm really appreciative of that. Two little shout outs I wanna give to the University of Minnesota uh, under the, the direction of Tad Johnson and Karen Diver. We now have tuition free at the University of Minnesota campuses for the first two years for uh, Minnesota tribal enrollees, which is very exciting. And I did wanna say um, thank you about the comment about the super power secretary, because my 11 year old granddaughter was having some issues at school with her teachers. And one of the things I told her is don't let them take your superpower away from you, Danica. Make sure that you stick by that at all times and remember who you are. And so those are very good messages and it's exciting to be a part of the panel. It's exciting to have this administration so involved with Indian country and Chi Miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Chief Benjamin. Uh, now I'll turn to Chief Hoskin. Well, Waddell, again, for being part of this panel, I thank my fellow panelists. Uh, thank you to the hosts. Thank you to the secretaries. Um, this is such a, an important topic. I don't think we can overstate it. Uh, I do want to mention how impressed and encouraged I am by the memorandum of understanding on language. I think that is going to make a real difference in our effort to save the Cherokee language and to save native languages across this country. So my appreciation. Uh, as I think about this topic, um, you know, the aspirations of all of our people across Indian country, and those aspirations are high and they should be high and the expectations should be high. They're really in the hands of the youngest natives in this country. Yeah, and that's where the hopes and dreams lay. But for the rest of us, we've got to maintain and advance a commitment to getting them an education so that they can meet all of those expectations, all of those aspirations. That's our job. And I think we did a little bit of that today. The hard work is ahead, but I appreciate what I heard today. Looking forward to more partnerships with our federal partners. Widow. Thank you. Now we'll now turn to Chair Andrews Maltese. Thank you so much. And again, appreciate this opportunity so much. It's exciting. We're on the verge of something that is really big and could be transformative for generations to come. And I believe honestly that through the commitment that has been expressed here, uh, Madam Secretary and Mr. Secretary, I believe that together we really can build a really transformative educational system, not only for our Native students that are on uh, and attending our tribal schools and our educational systems that are run and owned and operated by tribes, but also in the public school system. I think that by committing to those assistant secretaries, by committing to the Indian office by committing to working round tables and working through multi um, departmental issues, we can truly build a, a transformative type of educational system that will not only enhance our current um, in um, educational opportunities, but really lay a foundation of excellence for our children to come. Katapatanamu, Katapatanamu, Katapatanamu. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman, so much. So um, this topic is so broad. There's no way we could have done, um, uh, talked about it all in, in an hour, but you gave us so much to think about. I know there are staff feverishly taking notes. Um, I might ask that you share your notes with us so that we can put it um, forward to the White House Council staff. Um, the committee uh, that works on education, I think would be uh, well served by having um, some of the items you put on the agenda for us. So I thank you all. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, Chair, Chair payment. payment. I'm sorry. Yes, <laughs> Chair Payment, please. Oh, I was about to wrap that really up. Fast. You get to go. Really you go. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad I can't thank help you. Myself. So wow, what a phenomenal panel. I'm so proud of our Indian educators. A shout out to my NACI colleagues who are watching. As a quantitative social scientist, again, we must establish an academic profile of 100% of our Native students as relative to the general population. A persistent worst of the worst dropout rate is a matter of social justice and civil rights deserving an elevated commitment as a treaty right and trust obligation. 
I'm a high school dropout at 15, but I went on to earn a bachelor's, three masters and a doctorate. My sister, Karen, dropped out at 16. She has an associate's, a bachelor's, a master's and is dissertation phase for her doctorate. I beat her though. She's my older sister and I beat her. Yeah. Um, but we are proof that given the opportunity, our people can attain ed any educational goal. So I wanna say Jamie Gwetch to Secretaries Holland and Cardona and my fe fellow tribal leaders. And also for you, Anne-Marie, for all your advocacy for Indian education. Jamie Glitch. Thank you very much, Chairman Payment. My apologies for that. But um, those were my closing remarks. Um, I want to thank you all very much. And to Secretary Howland and Secretary Cardona, thank you for being here with us today. I will close in gratitude um, in my language, Pina Gigi. <laughs>